All right. Well, hello, folks. Um, I'm so glad you're able to join me today and participate with the Consumer and Family Network Conference. And just a little bit about myself. I'm Pamela Mack. I'm the Director of Advocacy Services with the North Dakota Protection and Advocacy Project. And what I'm going to do today is share some information with you about individual justice planning in North Dakota and how that interfaces with people with disabilities and the relevance that it has for you within the work that you folks do. So just a little bit of history about individual justice planning or the IJP process in North Dakota. The first IJP manual and the process was started in the late 80s and it primarily was a group of people and professionals that were working in the eastern part of North Dakota and were addressing the movement of people from the Grafton State School into the community as part of the ARC versus North Dakota lawsuit. And as a group of people with developmental disabilities were moving from institutional placement into the community, there was efforts to ensure that there was a clear interface between the criminal justice system and at-risk behaviors that were identified with the group of people that were moving into the community. And so the IJP process in its original form was very specifically geared towards people with disabilities and how that worked within that deinstitutionalization process. For a number of years, it was used very successfully and yet it was very much in the Eastern part of the state. And again, primarily just with people with developmental disabilities. There was a hope that that process would continue as part of person-centered services within the disability service systems across the state. However, it really did not have the legs and the sustainability that was hoped. And so over the next 17 years, it was used sporadically, but very much so just with people with developmental disability. So in 2004, CNA was asked, because we were one of the original partners with the IJP process, if we would be willing to revise the manual and bring that process back to the forefront of services, and also at the same time, look at expanding its use across various disability groups, and also an expansion of how it was used within the system. So could there be ways in which it could be used earlier in the process and as a prevention tool or preventing a revolving door within the criminal justice system? And as a whole, could we look at ensuring that we're preventing people from becoming involved in the criminal justice system? So that was done in 2004 and the current manual that is on the PNA website and which has been disseminated across the networks since 2004 is that version. However, our PAMI Advisory Council and a group of people, including CFN and the Service Delivery System and people with disabilities, have really asked that we look at expanding that and again update it. And so there currently is a work group that is in place that is looking at revisions to the manual, again, looking at how can we more effectively use this and also ensure that we are adequately identifying how youth that may become involved in the juvenile justice system or are at risk of becoming involved could benefit from the use of an IJP. So that's where we're currently at, and that work group will be hoping to review and roll out revisions within the next few months. So that is exciting for us, and we're super excited to see that continued growth and expansion of the process. So when you look at the IJP manual itself and the contents of the manual, there are a number of things to take a look at. 
So at first, there's just an overview of what the manual will include. And then there's also a number of chapters that are the substantive information from the IJP process. And then there's a number of appendices that are meant to be supplemental and provide additional information and guidance about the process, the criminal justice process, resources within various regions, and just information so that the whole content of the manual has some additional supplemental materials and explanation. So the first part of the manual, which is chapter one, really does define the vision and the purpose of the IJP process, which is to really help create an individualized and a tailored response to people with disabilities who might exhibit behavior or at-risk symptoms for involvement in the criminal justice system. The IJP process also presents alternatives um, as well as resources and contact information so that we can ensure that there's a response to people with disabilities that is individualized and takes into consideration how that person's disability may impact them. The IJP manual and its process also provides a framework for education and collaborative and cooperative work between the disability service systems and those in the criminal justice and juvenile justice systems. And so that really is what the vision and the purpose of the IJP process is intended to be. Chapter one also includes information about how those two systems may integrate with one another, how the tools could be used by various people within the system. And it does also identify and clarify that the IGP process is not intended to not hold people accountable for behavior that they may engage in that is criminal. And it is not to intend so that people are not having to take responsibility and or shortcut the civil or legal rights of people. The importance is of public safety, and that is a priority when developing an IJP and addressing the system as a whole. One of the things that we found within the IJP process is that there was not a degree of common understanding between the disability service system in the criminal justice or juvenile justice systems because varying terminology is used. Um, the systems as a whole, one is proactive, one tends to be more reactive. And so there really was a recognition that we needed to address that and we needed to look at how that comes into play for people. The other important factor to remember within the IJP process is that it is voluntary and it provides for a framework and outlines supports and services and perhaps aspects of support that is needed and or should be provided. And it does not carry any legal authority or mandate or require services unless it's part of a court order. There are times that you might see um, an alternative treatment order, an ATO that is infused into an IJP that then becomes a condition of a court order or probation, some of those types of things. And if that's the case, then it can definitely carry that process within the legal realm, but the IJP process itself does not have any legal authority. So chapter two within the IJP manual and the process really defines the eligibility or who would benefit from the use of an IJP. And so just to provide clarity with that, it is a person with a disability that may be developmental, a person with an identified brain injury that has resulted in impairment to them cognitively, an individual with a mental illness and its impact that is significant to them. One of the things that we have also identified is um, 
in the scope of some of the revisions right now is that we may have people as they're going through the aging process, maybe they have dementia or other neurological impairments from a, a diagnosis that may be healthcare related, that they may also have some involvement in the criminal justice system. So I do see this eligibility piece broadening a little bit so that we're ensuring that it includes all people with disabilities who may or benefit, who may benefit from the use of an IJP. So I would anticipate in the revised manual and process that this eligibility piece is just a little bit broader. Chapter three outlines how an IJP can be used within the criminal justice or the juvenile justice system. And the use of it can occur and truly is most effective when it's at the earliest point of contact by any agency or entity that may be providing support or services to an individual with a disability. And so along with that, it might be a, a case manager or a program manager. It might be someone within the school system. And so if they have knowledge that a person is exhibiting or displaying at-risk behavior, the use of an IJP and its infusion into how we support people at that earliest point is incredibly helpful. There are also processes within the system of itself, whether it be the adult or the juvenile system, when there's those at-risk behaviors. And so maybe we're looking at a juvenile court diversion process. And so the use of an IJP could be looked at at that point in time. With the IJP, you can also look at how you want to align that with maybe a treatment plan or a crisis plan. Maybe you have a behavioral support plan that outlines responses or proactive interventions that would be looked at to support people to minimize the presence or the risk of criminal behavior. And so at those times, we wanna make sure that we're aligning the IJP with those plans. We also see when people are going through the reentry process, if they've been involved in the criminal justice or the juvenile justice system, that we need to ensure that we're looking at how can we then use the IJP process as a prevention tool to prevent recidivism within those systems. So those are some of the key factors. So another important point is to ensure that we're looking at when do we develop an IJP and how do we take that opportunity when it's going to be the most effective. And so there have been some efforts to provide information and training to law enforcement to recognize when a person with disability has perhaps been involved in an, an incident or maybe a traffic stop or um, a, a call and there's a need to respond. There's also opportunity when someone has been arrested or if there's an intake that's being done by jail personnel, that early recognition that someone may have a disability and that it's impacting them is incredibly important. When we get further into the judicial systems, um, either the prosecutor or the state's attorney can ask the question if a person has a disability and whether or not an IJP would be helpful. We have also found using defense attorneys to be very effective so that it might be used as a, a method to support negotiation with the prosecutor and to look at how that system could be individualized and a response be utilized so that it's effective. Because one of the things that we find, for example, is if a person with a disability isn't their own payee if they have social security monies or if they have a guardian for managing their finances, giving them a fine 
in response to a criminal act is not going to have any benefit in preventing them from having future involvement because the concept of money or the impact that that has on them is not going to accomplish what typically a fine would do if we're wanting it to prevent future behavior. So really ensuring that an IJP is in place to create appropriate responses is helpful. I talked a little bit already about the defense attorney becoming involved, but that is one of the critical pieces because that is the person that is responsible to defend and ensure that a person who has become involved in the criminal or juvenile justice system has adequate representation. And so that, that defense attorney can play a very important part, but we need to ensure that they are knowledgeable about the IJP process and how it can be used. Again, as we get further into the system, you might have a pre-sentence investigation or a fitness to proceed evaluation that's being done to assess whether or not the person has the ability to understand the proceedings, if they're able to assist in their own defense. And in that process, there very well may be an important aspect to consider maybe as an alternative treatment order or a diversion process, the use of an IJP. We've also had a couple of instances where someone has been through the criminal justice system and there has been sentencing, but maybe there's a recognition that the traditional system is not going to be effective and there needs to be an alternative. And so a rule 35 provision is the process where you can look at a reconsideration of sentencing that is done for someone that has already been adjudicated and gone through the process. However, there's an ability for the court to look at it further. And so utilizing an IJP in that process can be very effective. So as I mentioned earlier, that aftercare planning or that reentry process is an important aspect to consider and again, that prevention of future involvement. So in chapter four of the IJP manual, there are a number of concepts that we've included information about just because when you're taking two systems that have very different terminology, there is an importance to ensure that people can have knowledge and perhaps share common language and or refer to information so that they know what that is. So this is just an alphabetized list of concepts that become part of it. Accountability, competency, least restrictive alternative, control versus incarceration, due process. And what we mean by due process is, has the person had adequate representation? Do they have access to their attorney? And are they, are they or have they been informed of their rights? Do they understand them? Has it been given in language that is accessible to them if they've needed accommodations in order to understand that information? Has it been provided? And have they been formally informed of their right to consent to the use of an IJP and or determined that they may or may not be in agreement with aspects of it? Normalization and the use of natural consequences is an important part of that and also something that we need to take a look at as we're actually writing the IJP. So when we go to write the IJP, chapter five is broken down into the various sections of what the content of an IJP may look like. There's always the ability to delete portions that are not pertinent or do not have relevant information that is needed for a particular person. And so this really does and should become individualized for the individual. 
So it starts out by just defining what are the presenting problems? What is occurring with that person that has brought them or resulted in their involvement in the criminal or juvenile justice system? Has there been a history? How significant is that? Have they had past offenses? Have they served jail time? So just really kind of a summary of what is currently going on and if there's any relevant history. The second part is an assessment that really is broken down to help a, a group of people that are writing the IJP to ensure that they are looking at all aspects of a person's life that may have relevance. Where do they live? Who do they live with? Do they work outside the home? Do they attend a vocational program? Do they have medical or mental health and behavioral health, substance use issues that are impacting them? What are their financial resources? And is that a barrier because they have not been able to access supports or services that they need? Do they currently engage in social or recreational activities that are positive or does it create some risk for them? And what are their practices? What is their cultural background and their connectivity to family and how those two play may, may play a role? And then do they have transportation or access to services needs? One of the things that we find in, especially our rural communities is the ability to, for people to have access and transportation in order to get to appointments, seek support and assistance, transportation can be a real barrier. And so if that's something that is relevant for that person, we want to make sure that we're recognizing that. And then do they have advocacy needs? Do they need to be empowered to have a stronger sense of self-advocacy or do they have people that will advocate for them and what does that look like? What do they have for natural supports? And or if they have staffing and paid supports, what does that look like? So all those different aspects become part of that assessment and really trying to ensure that we have a good understanding of the person. The third part of the IJP and the actual writing of it is to really break down and identify what are the supports and services and available resources that could become part of wrapping a comprehensive plan around a person with a disability? And how does that integrate with the supports and services that are available in the criminal or juvenile justice system? And what do we need to access from community-based providers within the private network or perhaps the public network? And how do those all come together? We should always be looking to ensure that services are the most effective, but also the least restrictive. So how are we promoting autonomy and independence and empowerment to ensure that we are not instilling consequences or supports that are more restrictive than what they should be? And how do we really manage that effectively so that people feel like they are in control and able to direct their supports and services? So all of that becomes, what are our recommendations about how that looks? What does the person tell us is important to them? And how do we ensure that we really have person-centered practices and services for people with disabilities? The other thing we want to identify is how do service providers and others play a role in each of those aspects? When do they interface? When do they become part of the support? And are there ways that they could be a hindrance? And what do we need to take a look at? So all of that becomes part of the recommendations that we build within that IJP. Other aspects to recommendations really are just defined to ensure that we're looking at and considering different factors. Do we have behavior support needs that we need to ensure that providers or people that are working with an individual 
have knowledge of? Do they need counseling or emotional support? Do they need some supervision or case management to mitigate risk? Or peer mentoring, peer counseling, um, connectivity to people that really can help mentor and support. Instead of doing jail time, would it be more effective to look at community service in place of alternatives? Is there a need to look at acute hospitalization? And if so, what does that look like? Another component that you can also infuse into the IJP process is mental health advanced directives. And I know that many of you will be also receiving some information about that process. And so in lieu of hospitalization, how can we use some of those systems more effectively? If a person doesn't have adequate support at the present time, do we need to look at getting other agencies involved or transfer to a different agency? Is there some additional treatment or training that needs to be taken a look at? And do people have adequate support with medication management or accessing their medications? Are they able to effectively utilize that as a support and ensure that they have management and oversight of what's going on in their life with their medication. And then there's a number of recommendations or responses as far as restitution, fines, probation, incarceration. Um, and if those are used, what does that look like? And what are the risks that it may pose for a person that may be involved in the criminal or juvenile justice system? And do we recommend any of those versus others? And would one or the other pose a risk that should not be considered? So making those types of recommendations for an attorney and or um, a judge to respond to involvement is really important because it comes from those that know the individual the best and the individual themselves. So really working to ensure that that is done effectively is something that we really want to ensure that we include in those recommendations. The other thing that you might wanna take a look at is are, are there other recommendations that, that aren't related? You know, Maybe it's really ensuring that the person has a stronger level of employment because if people are competitively employed and working, we know that it allows for less time to um, engage in other things that may not be as productive. And so just other recommendations, really trying to look holistically and from a person-centered perspective at the supports for people with disabilities. The other thing within the IJP is what do we hope to have as the anticipated outcome? Um, are there things that we continue to see at risk behaviors producing? How are we going to address them? How are we going to in law, involve law enforcement and educate them about this person or develop an individualized response so we do not have continued involvement in the system. And so really making sure that we identify what is that outcome that we want to achieve. The other two processes that you really wanna take a look at is ensuring that the IJP is integrated into an existing plan. So maybe there's an outcome support plan for a person with a developmental disability there might be a treatment plan for a person with a mental health diagnosis. Uh, there could be a care plan for a person with a brain injury. So if they have an existing service plan, you really do want the IJP to become part of that or mesh with it so that we do not have multiple plans out there that may conflict with one another. Having one single coordinated plan truly is the outcome that we hope to achieve. And then the IJP itself should really identify who is going to be the point person to monitor that IJP, to ensure that it's reviewed and updated as it needs to, 
is that perhaps uh, a case manager or uh, a program coordinator or someone within the service delivery system, but you really want to ensure that there is um, a responsible person that is identified so that the IJP is an effective tool and is actively used within services. The other thing that I talked a little bit about back in the due process section is that you do need to ensure that there is consent, that the person with a disability understands that involvement with an IJP or the use of one, the development of one is voluntary and that the individual and or their legal decision maker may have involvement in that process. You may also have someone that is part of a supported decision-making arrangement. And so if so, is that person brought in to ensure that they're supporting the rights and protecting what a person's consent ability is to the IJP process? The individual, their supporter or legal guardian should be fully informed of the content of the IJP and their consent to its use and the content of it should be documented within the IJP itself. The last thing within the, the writing of the actual IJP is just ensuring that people understand that this is part of an individual's private record and it is subject to confidentiality provisions and that it should not be disclosed without authorization. And one of the appendices does include a sample authorization to disclose information. So if there's an intent by a provider or an entity to share this with say law enforcement, that that authorization to disclose that personal information is part of it. So just some things to ensure that there are rights protection and due process for the rights of people with disabilities. So chapter six, and we're kind of getting to the end of the chapter, so I will try to um, make sure that we keep tying these together for you, but the legal system within North Dakota does have a number of considerations should there be a point in time that a person with a disability becomes involved in both the adult system and the juvenile system. There is uh, an insurance of rights protection. However, we also know that there's a limited capacity of that system to provide for the supports if they do not have an interface or involvement of the other systems because those systems as a whole just do not have built in capacity or capability for providing supports and services for people with disabilities. I think a great example is if you look at the caseloads of say attorneys that are part of the indigent defense contract, if they don't have knowledge that someone that they are defending has a disability they may not know that there is a need to meet with that person well in advance and provide them with accommodations or modifications to material or information. So we really need to ensure that we are helping the system have a better and a more comprehensive and appropriate response to involvement of people with disabilities. There's also, I think, a lack of understanding or knowledge about people with disabilities. And along with that, there may be difficulties with that system adequately communicating or providing for the accommodations that a person with a disability may need. So we need to ensure that there's a recognition and a response to that is, that is appropriate. There's also a need to ensure that everyone is aware of their responsibilities in supporting and ensuring equal access and participation for people and ensure that their rights are protected and that due process steps are taken that are appropriate to ensure their full participation. But they may, may need some support and assistance with this. Along with 
the complexities of the legal system, there is a number of roles that people have that it's important to recognize. There's law enforcement and jail personnel, and they may not have knowledge of people with disabilities and the support services that are available. So we need to ensure that that becomes part of our process of educating and involving people that we need to just better mesh systems together. You always have the state's attorney or the prosecuting attorney, depending on what that looks like and where the charges are. And then as I talked earlier, there is always a defense attorney if there's a loss of liberty that may occur for a person. So um, an individual may need assistance if they're needing to apply for court appointed counsel and they may need to ensure that that defense attorney is knowledgeable about the IJP process and they may need assistance to present that to the court. If we have knowledge that someone may not understand the criminal processes, there is a need to ensure that that defense attorney is looking at fitness or competency if there is a disability that is present and it impacts the person. So really ensuring that we're taking opportunities to educate those people within the legal system and those that are going to interface the IJP process is important. You also have the judge that of course is going to be recognizing perhaps if there is a disability that is present and ensuring that that judge has knowledge is that last step to ensure that they are protecting the rights of a person. Parole and probation is another entity that may be involved after sentencing. It might be in a supervised role. It might be in an unsupervised role. They may also be brought in as part of a pre-sentence investigation um, or the process of really looking at how do we ensure that the completion of a sentence is taking place if there's a need for their involvement. The other thing that we talked a little bit about previously and other considerations to look at within the system is just that fitness to proceed. Does the person understand their rights? And do they have the capability to be involved and assist in their own defense? Do they understand the culpability and responsibility and have that ability to understand that what they did was a criminal act and how does that play into it? And then ultimately looking at how that plays into the criminal competency of a criminal charge itself. So that is kind of a summary of all the different chapters of the IJP manual and the IJP process itself. And so that is the core part of the manual. Then I, I mentioned when I talked about the table of contents and the appendices that there is a number of them that we included to just provide supplemental information. So I wanna run through those real quick, just so you know what's available. So Appendice 2 is a number of terms and definitions that are available just to help you understand the complex systems that we work in and how those might come together. Appendice 3 is a list of resources and entities that can provide supports and assistance to people with disabilities. And they're broken down into the eight human service center regions and then also by county. So those are just available resources. That is actually one section of the manual that definitely needs updating. So you currently will find that there are some of those resources that have changed and, and that will be one of the values of the updated manual too is that third appendice. The fourth appendices is um, actual copies of worksheets that can be used 
to develop an IJP, both the assessment and the document itself. So those are available in the manual itself. And then the fifth appendice is a number of IJP examples. So what does the full IJP look like for a person with a developmental disability, with a person that may have a developmental disability and a mental health diagnosis, a person with a traumatic brain injury, or a person that has just a mental illness and impacting them. So there's a number of written examples that just helps show you what a completed IJP looks like. Appendice 6 does have um, a copy of an authorization to disclose information that is both FERPA and HIPAA compliant and can be used to share the content or the existence of an IJP with other entities outside the systems. So those are just some sample forms that can be used. Appendice 7 is just information regarding disability awareness, um, tips on interacting with people, um, how to identify the presence of a disability, and how to distinguish between the different types of disability. So it's really just meant to be a tool to ensure that people have knowledge of what that system is and um, how can they identify? This is something that we use a lot with law enforcement to ensure that they have knowledge of what is a disability. And if I come into contact with someone who may not be responding to my questions well, or if I've asked them questions and they aren't responding, could that be the presence of a disability? So just in an effort to really ensure that we've got resource information on disability awareness. And the last dependencies in the IJP process and manual are just some flow charts to try to take a, a complex law enforcement and response to intervention with law enforcement and the criminal prosecution processes and, and try to create flow charts to help understand them because they are so complex. And yet we know that those aren't even inclusive of everything that is needed, but it just helps give a little bit of knowledge of what that looks like from original contact by law enforcement and then flow through the judicial process and what that might look like. So that is the final appendices. Oh, I thought I had, I apologize. I thought I had one more slide at the end that just had some contact information about PNA, um, but I don't, so I'll just kind of run that over again. My name is Pam. I have been involved with the IJP process for a number of years. I can be contacted at the state PNA office, which is in Bismarck. We are on East Broadway Avenue. Our phone number, if people would like it, is 701-328-2950. And if you want more information about the IJP process, you are always welcome to contact PNA. And the manual itself and all of the documents that I've talked about today are available on the PNA website, which is www.ndpanda.org. So ndpanda.org. So if you have more questions following the training today, I will definitely make sure that I'm available. And if you need more information or you, if you have some interest in looking at these materials in the manual itself, you're welcome to go to our PNA website and contact us if you have any further questions. But that's all I have for you today, folks.